Hello, everyone, and welcome to New Direction. My name is Jay Izzo, and oh, <laughs> do we have a great show for you. I know, I say it every week, you know. You, Jay, you always keep saying it. Oh, yeah, we have a great show, but you, the books are so good. How can I not have a great show? The authors are amazing. How can I not have a great show? It's just another great show. This book is no exception. It's called The Life is Too Short Guy. It's not that the guy is short. It's life is too short. Okay, here's the deal. The, the, the secondary title, I, listen to this, Strategies to Make Every Day the Best Day Ever. I'm going to personalize it for you. Strategies to Make Your Every Day Your Best Day Ever. That's what this book is. That's what this book is about. Listen, folks, I don't care about you know what's, 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 what's going on right now. You're in business, all right? If you're in business, the truth of the matter is you have control over so many things, and that is how your day is going. And if you're a leader, and and oh, Scott White, so good when he says this. If you're a leader, right, you are responsible for the tone of your company. Is it positive? Is it does it do you come in with the right attitude? Can you laugh at yourself a little bit along the way? Can you find that source of fun? Right? Do, 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 you, do you have that sense of purpose and everybody knows it and that you're glowing and ready to hit the day running? Are, are, are you that person? Are you ready to take action? Are you ready to do it? Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Right? Here's the thing. L-I-T-S-G. Right? Life's too short, guy. Let me just tell you something. We're going to talk about, so there's 10, there's 10 principles here, and we're going to work through a lot of them uh, together, Scott and I will, but I'm going to tell you, you're going to want to take notes on this, and then you're going to want to not just take notes. I need you to apply this to your life because the things that Scott says in this book are life changing, not just for you, but for everybody around you. These are world-changing principles. These aren't just me-changing principles. And that's the beauty of this book. But before we get to him, let's do what we do every week, right? We are four-part people. We are physical, mental, emotional, spiritual people. And the truth of the matter is if we're not working on ourselves every day in these areas, we're not growing. And if we're not growing, we don't stay static. We're, in fact, dying. And the truth is we got to be working on these things every day. The physical, the mental, the emotional, the spiritual. Got to be working on them. Right. So we have you rate yourself on a scale of one to 10. One, this area of my life is uh, right. And 10, this area of my life is, oh, it's awesome. All right. Now, here's the thing. If your number is low in an area, don't, don't get down on yourself. Think of it as your starting point to change. Right. This is where we grow from. So if you have a two in any one of these areas, you go, okay, I got a two. I got work to do. But how do I get myself to a 2.5? What can I change right now in this area to get myself to a 2.5? right? And we work from there, okay? So for example, in the physical area, right? How would you say you're doing when it comes to exercise, eating right, drinking enough water, getting enough sleep? Would you give yourself five being average, right? Whatever that number is, right? What, what do you need to do to change, right? It could be something so simple. It could be, I'm drinking a lot of soda. I need to stop. Okay, quit it. We're not telling you to take, you know, throw everything out the door, but start with something because here's the deal. You get the ball rolling in one area, it's easier for the other areas to start rolling, right? That's the beauty of it. Okay, so there's your first number. Second number is that mental, intellectual number, right? We can't be on a couch and be couch potatoes and think that somehow magically we're going to absorb knowledge, right, and growth, right? But we got to grow our brain. We, we've got to be active participant in our growth. We have to learn, learn, learn. Mm. I might come up a little bit later in the show, but the truth of the matter is we have to learn. We have to be part of that wisdom and knowledge and understanding of our life and our business and our work and our relationships. What are you doing? And how is that, how is that going for you? And what do you need to do to change it? What number would you give yourself? All right, that's two numbers. Second number is the emotional number. And you know what? Emotions are complicated, but we make it simple, right? Here's, here's how I want you to evaluate yourself. First is, the first part is, you know, how would you say you are doing when it comes to controlling your emotions under stress and pressure? 
And then secondly, how well are you able to tap into and understand the emotions of another person? Requires a lot. One, it requires, first of all, it requires self-control. The second requires absolute listening, but it also requires that you have an emotional vocabulary to understand what someone else is feeling. Sounds a lot like empathy, doesn't it? And by the way, when we are empathetic, it does make the world a better place because people feel understood. We all want to be understood. We all want people to understand us, right? So on a scale of one to 10, how would you say you're doing emotionally? And then finally, the spiritual area. And, you know, I think about this an awful lot. How do I explain the spiritual area? And the truth of the matter is we, if we remove the physical, the mental, and the emotional, what we have left is the spiritual part of ourselves. And the, and the fact of the matter is we are connected in some way spiritually to each other in the world. In some way, whether you want to agree with it or not. The fact of the matter is we all live by faith. You took a sip of coffee this morning. You believed it wasn't poisonous. You, you pushed the button in your car. It, you believed it was going to start. You saw the sign that said walk. You believed that you could walk across that street without getting run over. We do everything by faith. You probably have plans for the future. Just like I do, I believe they're going to happen. They haven't happened yet. That's faith. But then there's the spirit of who we are that connects beyond the physical, the mental, and the emotional with each other. Scott taps into that in this book very, 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 very neatly. And, you know, for some people, I ask them this. I said, well, for everyone, I ask you this. I, you know, when in the middle of chaos, what gives you a sense of peace? What gives you a sense of joy? Is it God? Is it nature? Or is it something else? And then is it working for you? So on a scale of one to 10, how would you evaluate your spiritual area? Those four areas are like the air and the tires of your car. If one of those areas is too low, what happens? The car, well, it kind of veers off and it's harder to drive and it's hard to steer. And if all four tires are low, well, over time, you can ruin the car. You know, so we want to bring our tires and inflate them to the right height so that we can run smoothly as well as we can. Speaking of someone who does that so well, his name is Scott White, and he is the life to life is too short guy, is the happiest guy you'll ever meet. After spending 15 years on Wall Street, he took a chance and became an entrepreneur and business builder. Today, he is a chairman and CEO of a public real estate company. Always looking for his next challenge, Scott has completed 15 marathons and one Ironman triathlon. Now Scott is on a mission to make the world happier one smile at a time. With his endless energy, he motivates and inspires everyone he meets to focus on happiness, gratefulness, and positivity. Scott's married to his high school sweetheart, Jen. Together, they are two of the most passionate Rutgers sports fans in the world. God bless them. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, Scott White. Scott, welcome to A New Direction. What an intro, Jay. Wow, that was awesome. I am fired up and ready. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you are so welcome. This is an awesome book. Um, let's 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 get the elephant out of the room right away. And you talk about this briefly in your introduction. Why so negative? Why why is the world so negative, Scott? Why are we so? Why why do we want to be there? Why do we want to live in that? You know, I wish I had a great answer. I have some some ideas, some theses, but honestly, I'm more focused on getting people to focus on the positive. On the negative, I think it's easier. I just think it's easier to be a critic. I think it's easier to wallow. I think it's easier to to find the bad things. You know, there, there's theories about evolution and those that were the most skeptical, the most negative, the most sort of, you know, you have your radar up, so to speak, for, for dangers around you as, as you go back in, in human nature and the development of human society, that gene pool probably survived more than the proverbial optimist that always felt safe. So I think there's some theories on that, but, but I don't spend a lot of time dwelling on that. I actually want to quickly pivot the conversation to, okay, well, I'm sorry that, that you are so negative. How can we make you positive? And that, that's my goal. That's the point of the book. And that's the point of, of me joining you today. Yeah. No, and I do want to go there. I, I, I think, though, what happens is, and I think you just nailed it, and that is it is easier for us to go down that road. And, and, I, and I think the one thing is about uh, having a positive um, self-being, uh, I think, you know, it does take work. And, and, I, and I think that's what's important here is that this is going to take work because it, we, we, you know, I, I'm a psychological professional. So, you know, our brain is resistant to change. And so when we are inundated with so much negativity, sure. 
It's very difficult for us to change, but it is so possible and it's so worth it. You and I are two positive guys. I am, I am a firm believer that it, the energy it takes to be negative is the same energy that it takes for me to positive. And so if I'm going to expend my energy, why not expend it in a positive way that influences others? That's kind of my philosophy of life. And so uh, I, I know that you feel that way. So let's talk about this uh, road to happiness that we have in chapter one. Um, and we get to meet um, L-I-T-S-G, which is the life is too short guy. Um, uh, it's an interesting chapter because you open up actually, um, not to be negative, but you actually open up with the, the death of your dad. Yep. And that kind of was an eye-opening experience for you. So walk us through how this really, really changed for you. So the, the philosophy, the attitude has really been evolutionary. You know, a lot of people have said, was there a salient moment? Did you wake up one day and you're like, all right, I'm the happiest guy. And the answer is no. The answer is it's, it's been a learning process and every day evolves and every day I learn and every day I, I try to practice this, this philosophy around positivity. As I look back on my life and as I was writing the book, I thought about four salient moments in my life that I think really had an impact on me. The, the first one was when I was 10 years old and my father had a heart attack. So I'm 10 years old. It's the mid 1980s. And, you know, I watched my dad um, have a heart attack. He spent some time in the hospital. Then he had triple bypass surgery. And that's all pretty serious stuff today. Think about 1984. Oh, and think yeah. about, the, you know, at that point in time, he had to fly across the country to have bypass surgery because there were only a handful of surgeons in the country that did bypass surgery. And there's no doubt it, as a preteen, 10 years old, that has a meaningful impact. That's an eye opener, a wake up call to, to realize that death came close. And, and thank God he did survive. And, and there's no doubt that was one of the most salient moments of, wow, life's too short. Then I fast forward and there were definitely other milestones along the way, but the events of 9-11 had a meaningful impact on me. I was a, uh, a junior investment banker working in Manhattan and, you know, working around the clock, you know, the, the life on Wall Street, the life of investment banking. If you, if you haven't actually experienced it, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's exactly what people say it is. It's working around the clock and, you know, there is no life. Forget about work-life balance. That's not even uh, mentioned. The reality is it's work and work and work. And, um, and that's what I was focused on. You know, I was young, I was hungry, I was aggressive, I was going to be the king of Wall Street. And, you know, then that that's Tuesday morning, I went into the city, a beautiful day, I walked by the World Trade Center and went to my office about probably seven blocks north of the World Trade Center, and then heard the first plane crash. And didn't know what it was, I wasn't facing south, I was actually facing the West Side Highway. And I was on a conference call. And I, was, I saw emergency vehicles start to come down the West Side Highway and I'm like, huh, you know, maybe I should go check this out. And I, I go see the, the hole and the smoke coming out of the World Trade Center. And as I'm standing there watching it, I'm on the 32nd floor, about seven blocks north of it. I watch the second plane come down the West Side Highway, careen on its side and boom, right into the building, saw the explosion. And I will tell you the day before that, it was about work and wall street and climbing the ladder and just over a year later i had my first child our, our daughter was there's no doubt a 9 11 baby and that changed my perspective and then you know you fast forward a few years and unfortunately i lost both of my parents at fairly young ages you know my my dad was 65 my mom was 70 and those were wake-up calls those were um you know, uh, I, I say I really became an adult the day I lost my parents and realized what life was like after my parents. So as I look back at the heart attack, the events of 9-11, the death of my dad, which was now uh, 17 years ago, I think, the death of my mom, which was about six years ago, those were building blocks for, you know what? Life's too short. Live in the moment. Enjoy it. Make the most of every minute. And as, as you highlighted in the subtitle, every day is an opportunity to be the best day ever. That's beautiful. You know, you said there's two underlying themes that help me drive my philosophy. The first is I'm full of energy. And the second is I'm confident. Talk to us about where the energy and confidence comes from, because I think this is important for people to understand that they have the same capability. Uh, it, it's a great way to ask the question because it's not unique. It's something that, that's learned over time. It's something that's developed. It ties very much to the philosophy. If you have a positive philosophy, you see the world 
through through rose colored lenses or bright, bright lenses. You look at every situation, good, bad, or indifferent as an opportunity. It gives you a greater level of confidence. So I, I think too often we blame the world around us. Too often we blame our circumstances. Too often we, we don't self-reflect and look in the mirror. Good, bad, or indifferent, you own your life. You own how you're spending your minutes. Be confident in what you do. By the way, you're not going to get it all right. You're not going to, you're not going to succeed at everything. You're going to have failures, but here's an opportunity. Instead of saying, oh, I'm not good at this or I suck or whatever. You say, you know what? Got that wrong. What did I learn? How do I do it better? Boom. Confidence. Energy, I think is a little bit different in that energy is, is, you know, people's energy levels vary considerably. And certainly mine does at different times during the day. Although people would tell you that I just go from super energized to marginally energized and I rarely go to, to, uh, out of energy, but look it all, it happens. There's no doubt about it, right? We're all human beings and we all, uh, require rest and reset. But, you know, I, I, the book itself is very much, I tell people the intersection between happiness, positivity, gratefulness on the one axis and urgency on the other. And when I think about energy, I think about today's your day. Like tomorrow's not guaranteed. So if you're waiting for tomorrow to do something special, you're waiting for tomorrow to go out and live your best life, today's the day. And that's part of the, the theory or part of the belief around energy and making the most of every minute. I, I, I want to just say something because I, I just had this I don't know. It's not an epiphany. It's just kind of a eye-opening thing, and that is we go so so much on automatic pilot. Yep. And you know, we all we all wake up. Everybody wakes up. They have their cup of coffee. They do what they do, and then they go to work, and then they come home, and then they right. But sometimes we don't even remember how we drove to work. If you drive to work, we don't even remember the turns we made. We just it's just an automatic routine. That moment. If we could take that moment and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, what, what am I going to do to positively impact my day today? How am I going to positively impact others today? Yep. How am I going to make that? If we'll just take that second, right? It, 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 it could be such a life changing thing for everyone who's watching us on DBTV. Thank you for watching us on DBTV all over the world. And or, or, you know, listening on podcast or on radio, however you're listening to us and watching us. I just want you to stop right now, wherever you're at. And I, I want you to hear what Scott just said. And I want you to ask yourself a question right now, whatever day it is, how can you make a positive impact on other people right starting right now? Starting right now. Because it's such a life-changing thing that you're doing for you, but you're doing for someone else. I, I just... Sorry, I just found that just it, just it, look. It's a it's a great intro. You said that you you previewed before there are ten principles, and one of the principles this is you sort of teed me up. So thank you to talk about minutes matter, right? So so what you just talked about is one of the principles I talk about is minutes matter. There are ten principles, and one of them is minutes matter. And and people think that I'm going to give you a magic formula to making the most of your minutes, or I'm going to give you a you know here's how you balance this against that. No, it's not what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a framework to think about, which is exactly what you just said, Jay. So you, so you did it very short and eloquently. I'm going to expand a little bit and give you some mental images, but here you go. So when, when you're born and look, life expectancy varies by country, male, female, so on and so forth. But if you just assume a life expectancy of plus or minus 80 years, just humor me, 80 years, that's 42 million minutes that you have in your life. Now, my guess is there aren't many newborns watching this show. Uh, my guess is, I'm just going to randomly guess here, that most people are halfway through that, that 80 years. Some a little more, some a little less. You'll have to do your own math. But if you assume you're 40 years old, that means your life expectancy is 21 million remaining minutes, okay? Invariably, you're going to sleep about a third of those. Now you're down to 14 million minutes. Invariably, most people will slow down, deal with physical or mental or psychological ailments in the final years of life. So we'll just whack off another million or two million minutes and round it and say, a 40 year old has about 12 million minutes left. So what I want you to do is think about those minutes and, and look, it varies by everybody. And I, I use this mental image of a barrel. Okay. So picture a barrel. In fact, I, if you're not driving you can close your eyes right now, and picture a barrel because this will work really well. Now, depending on where you are and who you are, you may picture different kind of barrels. For me, it's a wine barrel. I got a big wine barrel in my image. 
And in that wine barrel are gold coins. Okay. And I tell people, think about this barrel with these gold coins. And I deliberately select the gold coins because those are my remaining minutes. So every time I do something, including right now, being a guest on this show, I reach into the barrel and I grab out those precious little minutes and I use them thoughtfully, deliberately, and proactively. So what's the takeaway here? What's, what's sort of, the, you went through this whole math and this image. What, what do you want me to remember? Here it is. Very simply, as you think about your barrel, bear in mind, you have no idea how many gold coins are in that barrel. Okay. Treat them as precious, use them deliberately, thoughtfully, and proactively. And more importantly, bear in mind that you have a leak in your barrel. We all have a leak in our barrel. And it gets exactly to your point, Jay. We get through the, the day, the week, the month, the year, whatever it is. And we're, we're on cruise control. And we're like, my God, I'm exhausted. I've done so many things, but I don't know what I actually did today. I don't know what I got done. That's what Minutes Matter is about. It's about being thoughtful and making deliberate choices about doing what makes you happy, what makes the world a better place. You define that. So it's not right for me to say, you know, you should be reading instead of watching TV. You should be spending time with your family instead of working. Maybe not. Maybe you've made a thoughtful, deliberate, proactive choice. Says, you know what? Working makes me the happiest. That's fine. That's great. What I challenge people is don't go through life on autopilot and not realize how you're using your minutes. Beautifully said. His name is Scott White. He's the author of The Life is Too Short Guy, Strategies to Make Every Day the Best Day Ever. you got to get your copy available at Amazon bookstores near you. I promise it's going to be great and it's life-changing. You're listening to him here on A New Direction. Hey, folks, whether you're recovering from an injury or surgery, suffering every day, aches and pains, having difficulty performing activities of daily living, or maybe you're a professional athlete or a uh, high school athlete who's looking to improve the, how you move and feel, listen, the, the elite team at Physical Epic Physical Therapy will provide you with a customized treatment plan tailored specifically for you. When you're ready for your epic relief, your epic recovery, your epic results, don't look any further. Go to epicpt.com. That's E-P-I-C-P-T.com. And Linda Craft Team Realtors, for more than 38 years, they've been helping people transition in life. Whoa, Jay. I thought you said they were real estate people. They are. But you know what? Here's the truth. Every place you've ever lived has been a transition in life. And they've helped thousands of people for 38 years, over that 38 year period of time, help people take the stress and make that transition just a little bit easier. So when you're ready to make your next transition, whether you're selling your home or buying your next home, go with the transition experts. Go with Linda Craft Team Realtors. You're gonna be glad that you did. That's lindacraft.com, L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T dot com. And we're back here on A New Direction with Scott White and his book, The Life is Too Short, Guy: Strategies to Make Every Day the Best Day Ever. Uh, it's great. So, Scott, let's just, uh, I, I, I love how we got into uh, the, the first one, but let's go, let's move back into the very first piece of the top 10, the perfect 10, as you call them, uh, of, of, of a strategies. And the first one is something that I am such a firm believer in, and that is attitude is everything, the power of positivity. I, I'm a blur, bl firm believer that attitude is absolutely everything. It is the one thing that we can control. T give us your spin on it. So it's, it's such a simple concept. And that's part of the overarching theme of this book is so much of this is simple, really simple. And I want listeners, readers, viewers to understand that, that this is not an academic theory. This is not a business book. I, I, I'm happy to talk business with people. This is basic blocking and tackling. This is living every day at home, at work, with family, with friends, making the most of every minute. So, so obviously now you're like, all right, Scott, give me something to, to latch onto. I want something that, that I could take away as a practical tool. Here's your practical tool for attitude is everything, the power of positivity. Jay, do you remember when you woke up this morning, what was your very first thought? You open your eyes and uh, it's, well, I have gratitudes. So my very first thought is what I'm grateful for when I first wake yes. up in the morning. I, I have seven things. I'm, I'm, there's seven things I, I list down that I'm absolutely grateful for. In fact, I have in front of me, uh, these, uh, little gratitude cards and I write down seven things in my gratitude cards, put in my gratitude jar. And that's what I do with my that's morning cool. first thing. Awesome. So I will tell you that, that I have appeared before audiences across the country. I've been on dozens 
of podcasts, you're the first one to answer it that way. Um, so, so that's <laughs> wonderful. But let me tell you what I normally hear. I will tell you that about 50% of the time, and I've asked this question hundreds of times, literally, about 50% of the time I hear the, the um, uh, it was probably like, oh, I'm tired or probably I need coffee or probably need to go to the bathroom or some vague sort of recollection. And I tell people, there are, there are three sets of glasses that are sitting on your dresser. And, and, and this is such a simple concept, right? And Jay, you're going to look at me like, of course, everyone does this. But the reality is people don't. And what, what I've heard from people is that when I talk about this, it's like, yeah, come on. And then I get texts and emails from people weeks later saying, that actually works. That's pretty amazing. So here's the deal. And I, I deliberately do this. Like you have Three sets of glasses you could put on in the morning. You reach over to your dresser and I want you to do this tomorrow morning. You could either put on what I think most people put on the, uh, it's Wednesday and I don't feel like getting up, but I guess I will. Unfortunately, I think there are a number of people that put on their their muddy glasses. Their, ugh, it's Wednesday, it's dark, it's cold. I don't feel like getting out of bed. I have so much to do. Uh, why not proactively do exactly what you just said, Jay? And I can't believe you said it because so few people do. Literally this morning, and this is real. I grab my glass, I throw them on. It's Wednesday. It's the middle of the week. It's awesome. The sun is shining. I can hear the birds chirping. I'm in bed next to the woman I love. Both of my kids just recently went off to college and seem to be thriving, which is wonderful. I have a chance to be on Coach Jay's show today. I swear. I thought that this morning because I knew some of the highlights of my day. This is going to be an amazing day. I'm 10 seconds into the day, and I'm already fired up. I realize that that roadmap may take twists and turns throughout the day. There's no guarantee that these glasses are going to make your day perfect. But why not, as Henry Ford said, if you think you can and you think you can't, you're probably right. Why not wake up every day and set the tone as you do with gratitude, with gratefulness, with happiness, with positivity, and see where the day takes you? I, I Listen, I, I learned this. Uh, I learned this technique from a book I read several years ago um, by, of all people, uh, it was Rabbi Daniel Lappin who wrote this book, Business Success Secrets from the Bible. And uh, he had this challenge that said, I want you to take 30 days and I want you to write between five and 10 things down every single day when you first get up of things that you're grateful for. And I I was having you know struggles like everybody else does. And I said, okay, you know what? What, what do I got to lose doing this? Right. So I did it. And uh, the first few days, the first week was kind of like the normal stuff. Uh, I'm grateful for my cup of coffee. I'm grateful for my wife. I'm grateful for my house. I'm grateful for my dog, right? But then it started changing to I'm grateful that I'm not the person I was yesterday. I, I'm grateful that I have an attitude that believes in others. I'm grateful that I am a person who loves other people. I'm grateful that I uh, can inspire people to do better. Right, I mean, it, it just changed from things to something much deeper, and then it turned from thirty days to sixty days to ninety days to a year to certain now several years down the road, and it was such a life changing moment for me that because I recognized, and here's the beautiful thing, and I want to just share it with you, and I'll share it with the rest of the world, that gratitude jar that I have that has all my gratitudes in it, I can pick up any one of those gratitude cards from any year of any day and pick it up. And you want to know the truth is, I'm still grateful for them. Of course. Yep. Still grateful for them. I can read back through them and go, yeah, I'm still grateful for that. Yep. It, it I, creates a culture yeah. of gratitude, which is one of the things I talk about in the book is pushing people to. So I think what you do is absolutely wonderful and I love it. But I tell people having, you know, usually it's, it's right down three things at the end of the day. I've heard that a lot. And I'm like, yeah. that's, that, 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 that's the minimum viable product for all you <laughs> entrepreneurs. That's the the dipping your toe in the water. Right. Take that to the next level, which is what you just said you did. And, and realize as you're throughout the day, like as I sit here right now, I'm like, wow, am I grateful to have the opportunity to impact the lives of the people listening to this? Yeah. Wow, am I grateful to have the opportunity to meet you, Coach Jay, who, who has so much energy and such a similar, I mean, I can't believe you answered the question that way. It's like <laughs> blood brothers. I mean, this is the attitude of gratefulness instead of the, all right, well, I'm at the end of the day. What are three things? I guess I'm grateful that, uh, you know, I, I want people to to go through that evolution of living an attitude uh living a life of gratefulness well and this is why you know i hear people say they want to start end their day with it 
but start your day. Right, right. Agreed. Agreed. Set it sets the, the tone, tone right. Tone. Create the roadmap. Yeah, set the tone for the day, folks. Get totally the, get right. it going. Get it, get it going. Get it going out of get out of bed. Matter of fact, I interviewed a blue angel on this show, and he said that bef- that as his feet hit the ground in bed. That what he does is that he says, I, I, I list out my gratitudes. And that really encouraged me further to continue doing it. And, and it's just such an automatic habit. And, and I thought, if, the, if, if this guy's a blue angel, some of the most elite flyers ever, and that's how they start their day, I'm like going, we're, I'm on to something. Yeah. yeah. Right? And, and so it's, 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 really, it's really a big deal. All right. So let's move on to number two. Um, and and that is you, the choose your attitude. Oh gosh, I love this. God, choose your attitude and own it. It's choose very attitude, much tied it. to the first one. Yeah, own it. Go ahead. So so here is one of the few places that I actually refer to studies and empirical evidence. I again by design. I'm going to repeat it because it's important. I deliberately, in fact, painstakingly wrote this book not to be an academic book. I don't want someone to pick it up and be like, ah, that's great in the ivory tower, or that's great some theoretical scientists across the world. No, this is day-to-day blocking and tackling. With that, I threw in a couple of tidbits of empirical evidence and studies. And and the one that I talk about here, choose your attitude knowing it, I always ask people, and I'm going to guess you're going to know this too, because you seem to be right on the same wavelength as me. Um, what percent, so new house, new car, new job, new yacht, let's get crazy, new uh, a promotion. Okay. Five wonderful things or five not so great things. You're dealing with, with sickness or injury or death or loss of a job or divorce. What percent of your long-term happiness is tied to or predicted by the world and circumstances around you? 10%. Of course, you know it. Of course, you know it. <laughs> well, very few people, very few people know that it is amazing to me. I usually, when I give this talk and I've been doing a lot of talks around the country, I start with people, I go like this. I'm like, what do you think? 90%? Yeah. Good. Good. 80. Yeah. Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, I said a yacht, right? Oh, oh yeah. 80%. No doubt. 80%. It's 10%. Yep. It's 10% of your overall attitude of your overall long-term happiness is tied to the world around you. Okay, so where's the other 90%? Well, 50% is tied to a certain degree based on your genetic makeup, your eye color, your hair color, your propensity for certain disease, your propensity to view the world, your your psychological view of the world. About 50% impacts your overall happiness. But here's the beauty. You take the 50, add the 10, that's 60%. 40% of your happiness is entirely controlled right here between the way you view the world own it, choose it proactively. I'm going to live a happier life. I'm going to be deliberate and thoughtful in how I approach the world, the lens through which I view every situation, good, bad, or indifferent. Because by the way, we all deal with bad, right? I'm the happiest guy you're ever going to meet. I deal with setbacks. We all do. That's the reality. How do you view the world? 10% is the circumstances. 50% is hereditary. 40% you and I control. Own it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, you do quote another statistics in here that I just found, uh, real inspiring. And I want people to hear it. it the positive brain is 31% more productive. I just, I'm just, I just want you to sit and chew on that folks. The positive brain is 31% more productive. Chew on it. So let me, let me give you a couple of more statistics that are not in the book. This is bonus material again, because Jay, I, I really went out of my way not to make the book. <laughs> I <know you're> good. <laughs> However, here is, here are some statistics that, that I'll go slow through because I'm going to rattle off, but, but they're meaningful. Positive thinkers have a 77% lower risk of high blood pressure. Positive thinkers have a 13% lower risk of dying from any cause. Positive thinkers live on average 7.5 years longer. Mm. Positive thinkers have a 50% lower risk of developing Alzheimer's. Mm. All right. And that's just the health stuff. If you want, I can rattle off a bunch of business statistics for you too, but I don't want to put your audience to sleep. So let's stay away from the statistics. Trust me, it matters. It does. It does matter. You, okay. But you, you, you have something in here that I want to deal with because you're in real estate, right? Well, what, and, and people are going to ask, okay, well, Scott, Mr. Life is too short guy. What happens when the other people want to, you're in real estate. What happens when the other side wants to fight you? How do you oh, handle that? Fine. 
it happens all the time. Welcome to real estate. Every every day is is a is a brawl. I mean, right before this call, I was involved in a, a deep and heated negotiation. And and I tell people a bunch of different things as as I bring some of these principles into the workplace. I tell people, you know, one of the principles that I talk about is funny things are everywhere. Laugh every day, laugh at yourself, laugh at the world around you, laugh at your situation. And no matter how dire you think it might be, there's still something funny in there. There's still something. And as you negotiate with people and as you get into challenging situations, you'd be amazing how quickly you can lower the pressure in the room, lower the, the competitive argumentative nature with a, a, a well-timed joke, with a well-timed sort of softening the situation. And in, in the book, I talk about um, something funny that actually happened to my dad's funeral, right? You want to talk about one of the worst days of your life and one of the worst situations? Trust me, funny things are everywhere. And bringing those principles into the business world are a good way to, to lower the anxiety levels, the stress, and the pressure. Yeah, I, I, I just, I, I think I want people to hear that you know what, even when things, even when people challenge you, there is a way to stay positive and all that. And there is a way to, to break that down. And then there's another little subsection in this chapter, um, of attitude and owning it. And that is you're a leader, choose wisely. And, um, you, you say, as a leader, you set the tone for those who follow, talk a little bit about, you know, those who are in leadership, what their responsibility is with attitude and owning it. Well, here's the important fundamental principle before we go there, because some people may have just tuned out, well, I'm not in leadership. Guess what? We're all leaders, Yeah. right? Sometimes we're leaders as parents. Sometimes we're leaders as teachers. Sometimes we're leaders as mentors. Sometimes we're leaders as friends. Sometimes we're leaders in the, in the, the more traditional sense. You're the, the manager or the CEO, whatever the case may be. The reality is you have an impact on the people that surround you. So as a leader, you have responsibility for how you portray a situation. And look, I'm not suggesting that, that we lie or sugarcoat when things are bad, things are bad. However, there's an opportunity to, to view every situation through a certain level of positivity. And the way you approach it and the messaging you bring to those that follow you as a leader, that trickles down. So think about someone that actually works for you. I'll go the more traditional path. The way you treat that person and the way that, that you lead that person impacts when she goes home and deals with her kids. And then the way the kids feel it impacts how they deal with their friends. So you as a leader are impacting some random kid that you'll never meet by the way you lead, by the way you approach situations, by your tone, by your choice of words, by your approach to life. That's beautiful. Um, I went one last thing I want to hit up here, and it's a quote that you have in this book uh, by Vince Lombardi, uh, who I admire greatly. Um, Life's battles don't always go to the stronger or faster man, but sooner or later, the man who wins is the man who thinks he can. And uh, you talk about the power of self-talk in regard to perpetuating attitude. Give us a little, give us a little coaching and self-talk. Yeah, look, I love that. Um, I'm glad you 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 went down this route because few people actually find this little nugget in the book. I think it's a a subtext. Um, it, it gets back to attitudes, everything. Choose your attitude, own your attitude, set the tone. So as I said before, we all have setbacks and failures. And we'll get either look at those setbacks and failures as I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not strong enough, or that setback or failure is an opportunity to learn. I couldn't get, I couldn't accomplish what I set out to do today. However, from that, I learned X, Y, Z, because everything is a learning opportunity. And when I reapproach it tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, whenever I'm ready, here's how I'll do it differently. And by the way, you may fail again. You may fail a third time or a fourth time. But having that attitude and the ability to say to yourself, I can figure this out. I can overcome this. This is an opportunity. Maybe whatever you're trying to do, let's, let's just say you are trying to launch a, uh, a bakery. Okay. So, so you want to, you love baking. You want to launch a bakery and you underestimated the cash flow you needed and it didn't work. And then you try it again and you pick the bad real estate location. You learn. Maybe you parlay that into doing it a third time differently, different location, greater liquidity. Now I'm bringing in business principles. Or you say, maybe my skills, what I want to accomplish, maybe the bakery's not right today. 
Doesn't mean it's not right five or 10 or 15 years from now. However, what I did learn from that experience is greater runway of cash flows. Uh, real estate location matters a lot. Having a risk mitigation plan, whatever that case may be, and parlaying that into a different business or a different proposition. And by the way, this isn't just business. This works in terms of social relationships. This works in terms of involvement in organizations. Maybe you, you're really active in, in some organization and you want a, a leadership role. You apply, you get turned down. Okay, fine. So instead of taking that as, a, oh, they don't want me to be the membership director of this religious organization. I'm just picking an example here. Or maybe I'm not the right person for that role today. And instead of looking at it as a setback, it's an opportunity, self-talk, to say, I can, will, want to succeed by doing X, Y, or Z, or I will take my skills, my energy, and do something different within the realm of what I love to do. It's beautiful. His name is Scott White. The book is entitled The Life is Too Short Guy. L-I-T-S-G, uh, strategies to make every day the best day ever available wherever you can find books. Uh, it's fantastic. You're listening to him here on A New Direction. Folks, Epic Physical Therapy, my physical therapist, I think they should be yours too, by the way. They, their facilities offer the most advanced top-of-the-line equipment, including the Alter-G anti-gravity treadmill, the Norma Tech compression sleeves, my favorite, the Game Ready. Uh, ice and compression all at the same time. It's awesome. That's just a few. Listen, they're trained in certifying the most comprehensive cutting edge treatments available. Things like blood flow restriction therapy, dry needling, cupping in. That's just a few. Listen, when you're ready for your epic relief, your epic recovery, your epic results, don't look any further. Go to epicpt.com. That's E P I C P T.com. And Linda Craft Team Realtors for more than 38 years, they've been serving the world. And you go, well, wait, 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 wait. What do we mean, world? Well, Here's the deal. They're independently owned and operated, unaffiliated with any national company. And so they've been able to create the best relationships with the best real estate professionals in your area, regardless, right? So when you're ready to sell or buy, regardless of where you live, start with Linda Craft Team Realtors. They will connect you with the right people, the right professionals, wherever you live to get your transition journey started. You can go there by going to lindacraft.com. That's L-I-N-D-A-C-R-A-F-T.com. And we're back here on A New Direction with my friend, brother, I think. The life is too short guy. Strategies to make every day the best day ever. Scott White is with us. Uh, Scott, hope you're enjoying this. I'm having a, I'm having a blast. It's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> I'm enjoying it uh, for sure. Uh, I, I, I'm going to jump ahead. Um, I don't, I, I don't want to go necessarily in order. We've kind of jumped around a little bit, but I do want to jump ahead a little bit. You, you did talk a little bit about funny things are everywhere. And... Uh, and, and, and I think it's really important not only to have a sense of humor and you make this point too, it's not only important to have a sense of humor, but it's, it's important to laugh at ourselves too, isn't it? It's, it's about taking yourself, the world, your situation, whatever it be less seriously, Yeah. regardless of the situation. Look, it's very much tied to that attitude is everything, power, positivity, but it's a different spin on it in that. There are situations, and you and I touched on this before, you're, you're in a boardroom, you're in a negotiation, you're in a litigation. By the way, all three things I've been involved with, you're dealing with, with a death. Again, I mentioned before, I tell a story of something funny that happened at my father's funeral. You could always find a lens through which to find humor, to soften the situation, to approach it differently instead of being riled up and, you know, it's a battle, it's, it's a winner and loser kind of thing. No, relax, enjoy, smile, and laugh. Yeah, and I, I think the other side of that too is, you know, sometimes we get so caught up in shame and embarrassment when if we can just laugh at ourselves, oh yeah, you know, if we could just not take ourselves quite so seriously, right, and recognize that we're human and that we are, we are terribly flawed. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, folks, but the host of this show is terribly flawed and it's funny. I am, I am funny. My wife will tell you I'm one of the funniest human beings on the planet simply because of how I live my life. In fact, she will tell you that she married me because I made her laugh. And by the way, I can do that without even trying because that's how silly I can be. And, and, and so I, I, you know, I think about that often is that we do take ourselves too seriously and the ability to laugh at ourselves to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and laugh at yourself 
laugh at the situation and laugh at how, just how silly you are, I just think is powerful. There's, there's no doubt. It's, it's welcoming. It, it lets other people in. It eliminates some of that, that ego, right? It, you you oh, talked yeah. about how we're all flawed. It, it, um, you know, you talked about your wife marrying you for, for your level of humor. You know, I've been with my wife now for 30 years and I think she thinks she's still married to a teenage boy at times. Um, uh, you know, it just because, right, right. You just, we don't take ourselves that seriously. And it, 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 it lowers the, that, that wall that sometimes humans put up of, you know, I'm more important. I'm smarter. I'm better looking, by the way, I'm none of those. And, and I go the other direction and I'm just the average guy having fun, enjoying life, laughing, smiling, and making the most of every day. Yeah, I have a face for radio. So, I mean, yeah. uh, it's it's why I do TV is beyond me, but, I, you know, I'll do it anyway. You know, maybe it's because it's funny. Um, <laughs> chapter 7, <laughs> moving right along uh, from Foible. Chapter 7, learn, learn, learn. Oh, help us walk us through this principle because I'm a big fan of learning. So let's let's walk why this is so important to living our uh, making every day the best day ever. Yeah, so it, it's an opportunity. Every day in every situation is an opportunity to learn, and it's tied to the minutes matter concept that we talked about before. Instead of going through the motions and and getting caught on a a plateau, so to speak, where you've you know I I know what I know I know what I want to know and I if I don't know it now it's just not that important you, you kind of hit a wall you hit a, a stalemate you hit a a an area of your life where you're no longer bettering yourself okay so with that said what do you mean Scott I mean look at every day as an opportunity to learn something new and I'm not talking about necessarily in the academic sense we're we're not saying you know it's time to go back and get a PhD in physics. Instead, it's an opportunity to, to get out of your comfort zone, to learn something new. Maybe it's a musical instrument. Maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's a sport. Maybe it's a, a religious belief. Maybe it's understanding something that you're already involved in to a more in greater depth. And here I talk a little bit about the work of Carol Dweck. Um, for, for those that aren't familiar, she's written a little bit about uh, different attitudes about the ability to learn and whether or not you have a fixed mindset. I know what I know. I know everything I want to know. And if I don't know it, I, I don't really need to know it. Or a growth mindset, which is what I encourage people to think about in terms of there's always something new to learn. And this ties to what I talked about before, not yet. Right. So she talks about how maybe I don't have that skill today, but it doesn't mean I can't acquire that skill. I can't acquire that knowledge. I can't acquire that ability. Just not yet. So I encourage people to. And, and in the book, I talk about some some sort of goofy things I did a couple of years ago. I decided to become a youth soccer referee. Totally don't relate to anything I'm doing in my life. I kind of like soccer. Actually, I do like soccer a lot. My kids had uh, grown up and I was no longer coaching on the sidelines. I had played for a little while, but realized those days were long behind me. So I'm like, yeah, what can I do? And I, I uh, signed up to become a youth soccer ref. And, and I tell a funny story of, of driving out to the middle of nowhere and going into a, uh, a hotel that otherwise I probably wouldn't be caught dead in, going into a conference, actually I shouldn't call it a conference room, a dark windowless room with a gentleman at the front standing up there talking about offsides and, and tripping. And, you know, the things I remember is first of all, I sat down and I looked around and I'm like, okay, a room full of teenagers. All right. So there's the first issue. The second thing that, that I needed to overcome is, is the gentleman who's leading the class. Remember at the beginning of the day, this is what he says. He's like, all right, we're going to be here all day. Um, we'll have a break in the morning, we'll have a break in the afternoon, we'll have a break for lunch. The breaks in the morning are 15 minutes and 15 minutes in the afternoon or break for lunch for an hour. And if you're late, the door will be locked. Don't come in. You can call your parents to pick you up. And I'm like, who am I calling? Anyway, the point being, not taking myself too seriously, learning something totally new. I thought I knew a lot about soccer. I'll tell you, refing soccer is entirely different than watching or playing soccer. Got me out of my comfort zone. I can't say I've refed a whole lot in my life, but it's a new set of skills. And it's just an example of, you know, pushing way outside that comfort zone. It's, it's funny because I gave a talk to a, a group of lawyers earlier this year and, and I asked people, you know, so, so how do you get out of your comfort zone? How do you learn something new? And, and again, these are lawyers and like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm doing a little bit around finance or a little bit around accounting or a little, I'm like, 
No, I don't mean that. I mean, get out of your comfort zone. How about learning how to play a saxophone? How about learning how to uh, fly a kite or, or do something way out there? It's a way of, again, remember the overarching theme we're talking about here is living your best life, making every day the best day ever. Make today the opportunity to learn something totally new. Yeah, I, listen, I'm, I'm going to just speak psycho psychologically here for a second. We have two halves of the brains, right and left. Right side's creative, left side's more logical and we we have to exercise those and and there is nothing better than taking up an instrument i don't care what it is pick up a guitar learn a guitar it works both sides read a book um literally read a book learn a foreign language uh learn learn to become a referee uh something that is involving all those things it just it just enhances who you are and and you're never going to regret it you're never going to regret doing those things and uh, it's it's and it was such a beautiful reminder as you read it. I'm gonna we're we're as we run short of time here. I want to do chapter eight real quick and take a chance and get it done today. Is the title of the chapter uh, and uh, Dale Carnegie's quote: "Take a chance. All life is a chance. The man who goes farthest is generally the one who's willing to do and dare." Talk about that. So here I refer to, and I talk about a book written by a palliative care nurse from Australia, and it's called um, The Five Regrets of the Dying. And without going through all of them, the, the overarching theme, the key message, the takeaway is the biggest regret people have on their deathbeds is the regret of what they didn't do. Mm. It's not the mistake. It's not taking the chance. It's not something dumb they did, because we've all done that. It's what I didn't do. And we all have these ideas of, business opportunities, relationship opportunities, hobbies we want to take on. There's always a, yeah, but, you know, I'm going to do that, but. Uh, and, and I think about this personally too, because I've been wanting to write this book for years and it was always a, yeah, but I haven't written a book before. Yeah, but I don't really have time. Yeah, but I don't know where to start. Yeah, but nobody really wants to hear what I have to say. Yeah, but I, I could go on for days. And then finally, I'm like, you know what? Life's too short. Right. You don't want to look back later on. You know, I, to me, a life well lived, a wonderful life is when you get to the end and you have you don't have regrets about what you missed out on. You engage in the things you wanted to do. They didn't all work out, by the way. Again, let's acknowledge that everything's not perfect. This is not the perfect world, but you don't know until you try. So stop with the excuses. Stop with the I'm going to talk more about this in the book about how we associate Fear and risks as, as really negative words. They don't have to be negative connotations. Fear can be a motivator. Risk can be an, a, an assessment that pushes you to get out of your comfort zone and say, you know what? I'm going to take a chance. And when you think about the intersection of happiness, gratefulness, and positivity with urgency, today's the day. And I emphasize that in the book. It's take a chance and get it done today. It's not tomorrow. It's today. As you're listening to this, this is going to end in a few minutes. Your takeaway should be you know what? Guy's a little, little crazy, a little bit energetic, but maybe I do something tonight. Maybe I, I start that plan for something I want to do tonight. Beautiful. You were awesome. We've done an hour. Tell, tell, it's gone fast, brother. Tell, tell me, tell people how they can get a hold of you. So the easiest way is the website, lifeistoshortguy.com, lifeistoshortguy.com. You can find out more there about the book. You can find out about uh, my speaking engagements. I'm traveling now and trying to spread this message as much as possible. My, I am truly on a mission to make the world happier one smile at a time. And, and what makes me so satisfied, happy, grateful, positive more than anything is the feedback I'm getting. I, I woke up to an email this morning. I have a newsletter, which you could sign up for on, on the website. Um, and I woke up this morning to somebody sending me a note that I haven't seen in years saying, wow, this is powerful. This is amazing. Has me thinking, have a little bit of a setback at, at the company. And, you know, my, the topic was the glass is neither half full nor half empty, but rather it's completely empty because the half full glass means you only have halfway to go. And I think every day is a new opportunity to start to, to exceed expectations. I don't want a half opportunity. I want a full opportunity. He's like, wow, that's wonderful. The point being, every day is a new opportunity. So life is too short, guy. Yeah, I'm trying to spread this message as much as possible. Beautiful. And we're going to be doing that throughout the week. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the show. You know what I say to you every week? You're in control of three things. And they're very consistent with what Scott says. You're in control of your attitude, your effort. That's your excellence and your resiliency. I know that circumstances can be tough. I know that things are happening in your life. But the truth of the matter is you always have control of those three things. Take control of them now. 
because they're within your power. I'm going to be back next week with another great guest. It's another great book. It's going to be another great show. As I say to you all over the world, listen, you got a lot of choices you chose up. I am so grateful. Give us a positive review and a thumbs up on YouTube. As I say to you all over the world, you know what that is. Ciao, everybody.